Those are the infinite insults. There's two basic uh, approaches. One is a biochemical. That's everything you can think of. That's toxic metals. It's the top five risk factors. Biohumoral, infections, metabolic, sterile antigens, non-sterile antigens, and so forth. Everything else falls into biomechanical. That's blood pressure, the stress on the arteries, the hemodynamic things, the blood flow. Now what happens when those insults attack the endothelium, which is the lining of the arteries, they create what are called neoantigens. In other words, they damage the endothelium and it becomes a foreign protein. And your body then attacks the foreign protein and sets off the inflammatory responses and immune responses. So you'll see the blood vessel here, and sitting on the top of the blood vessel are various receptors. Toll-like receptors, TLRs, nods, and calveoli. We're going to talk a little bit about each of these, but those are the receptors that set off the three finite responses. And those finite responses are basically, again, inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction, which causes endothelial dysfunction, arterial and compliance issues, and that leads to cardiovascular disease. So take this slide and look at it at 2 o'clock this morning and remember it because this is the key to the so here's the first major breakthrough. Hypertension is not a disease. It's a response to damage to the endothelium. In fact, hypertension becomes really a normal response that is dysregulated. So this environmental genetic interaction causes a maladaption syndrome. So the marker for endothelial dysfunction early is an increase in blood pressure. So our entire approach for the last, whatever, 100 years, since we can measure blood pressure, has been a little bit misguided. In other words, we're treating the sphygmomanometer, a number of the blood pressure. Our goal is not to lower the blood pressure per se, it's to treat the artery to make it healthier because if you improve endothelial dysfunction and make your vascular system healthy, what happens? The blood pressure will fall because it's simply a marker of the underlying disease. So one of the key factors in looking at blood pressure now is, and I'm going to really make your day now, is that when you measure blood pressure with a sphygmomanometer, it really gives you false information. In fact, within the next five years, the sphygmomanometer become a secondary modality to actually determine vascular health and blood pressure response. That's because there's a disconnect between what's going on in your arteries and what's going on with the sphygmomanometer. You can have horrible vascular problems and have a normal blood pressure. Okay, so uh, as we go through this, I'm going to show you how you can look at the artery as your primary goal of treatment. So we've established that hypertension is not a disease, but it's a marker of ED and vascular dysfunction. And it's one of multiple responses that the artery can make to the multiple infinite insults. Now this disease starts early. As soon as you come out of utero, in fact it may actually start in utero. Uh, the predisposition to hypertension or vascular disease actually begins very early, and that's part of the epigenetics related to the mother's exposure to various environments. So this vasculopathy that occurs is related to endothelial dysfunction. There's remodeling of the arteries. There's inflammation. There's increased arterial stiffness, which you see with an increased systolic blood pressure and a lower diastolic pressure, that is a widened pulse pressure, and you lose elasticity over time. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that hypertension is really a correct response to an insult. The body is defending itself against something, and that's the three responses. So the goal then is to fix the dysregulation that is going on with the So when you look at the phenotype of what happens to a uh, hypertensive patient. You have a vascular phenotype and then you have the programming that's occurred genetically. You have imprinting, you have epigenetics thrown on top of that, and then that's compounded by just the normal aging of the artery over time. So you get all these different responses that we've talked about and the artery becomes stiff and over time you get a hypertension and vascular disease. 
So let's look at the artery and what is actually going on. Uh, the lumen is here, then you have a very thin layer here that's the endothelium, that's the key area. Below that's the vascular smooth muscle or media. So this endothelium is the key to understanding what's happening both within the blood elements but also to the vascular smooth muscle. And so the, the uh, endothelium is the air traffic control system. It's talking to the blood, coagulation, platelet dysfunction, monocyte adhesion, and inflammation. Normally, the endothelium is like Teflon, nothing will stick. But once it becomes damaged, when it has gap junctions that open up, you get a crack in it, then things go haywire and white cells start to stick. And once they start to stick, you have the process of atherosclerosis. So below the endothelium is the vascular smooth muscle, and that's where you have increase in permeability, contractility, proliferation, migratory problems, and oxidative stress. And one of the key markers that you can do in your office for determining permeability in early endothelium endothelial dysfunction is microalbuminuria. So that's an easy test. It's covered under insurance, and it's uh, one of the best ways to determine early renal disease, but also generalize endothelial dysfunction. Now, vascular biology is very complicated, but I'm going to make it really simple for you. And we're just going to look at two of the major mediators for vascular dysfunction, the pro and the con. Angiotensin II is probably the most dangerous hormone available in the chronic setting to induce vascular disease. So it causes vasoconstriction, hypertension, inflammation, oxidative stress, thrombosis. It is, in fact, a pro-atherogenic hormone. Now, in the acute setting, when you get attacked by a, um, a bear in the woods, you would like a lot of angiotensin II to do all this stuff because it allows you to escape. But if this is a perpetual problem, it becomes dysregulated and you have vascular disease. On the other side of that is nitric oxide, which is the antithesis of everything angiotensin II will do. So it vasodilates, lowers blood pressure, reduces inflammation and oxidative stress, and actually is preventing atherosclerotic disease. Again, the vascular system, very complicated, but let's look at one very important issue is how you can put this together uh, in, a, in a physiologic issue. Uh, right here is the angiotensin II receptor that sits on the endothelium, and that's what's stimulated by angiotensin II. So when you stimulate angiotensin II, it goes through a whole cascade of events. But what's the final pathway through this receptor right here? Anybody know what that is? That's superoxide anion. It's an oxidative stress marker, and that stuff goes to hydroxyl anion, peroxynitrate, and all the oxidative stress mediators. What is neutralizing superoxide anion? Nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, as you can see, is a precursor through L-arginine and a very famous enzyme called ENOS. So you can now see that if you can increase this pathway and mitigate the effects of this pathway, you increase bioavailability of nitric oxide, takes out the angiotensin II, balances to the good side of the scale, and you get anti-atherogenic, anti-inflammation. So your key in understanding how to treat vascular disease is to learn how to increase nitric oxide bioavailability and decrease the effects of angiotensin II. Now, it's a lot more complicated, but for a practitioner, if you get that, you'll have it made, and we'll talk about how nutrients, how nutrition, and drugs can interact to improve that process by increasing nitric oxide. 